This week we read Parshat Vayishlach, the culmination of the Yaakov story, as Yaakov returns to Eretz Kanaan with his family. At first, his return, his return seems triumphant. He overcomes his struggle with the angel, God changes his name to Israel. he makes peace with his brother after many years of estrangement and anxiety. And in fact, at the end of Parak Lamed Gimel, the Torah tells us, Vayavo Yaakov Shalem Ir Shechem, and Yaakov came Shalem, complete, or in peace, to the city of Shechem. However, this peace is shattered almost immediately at the opening of the next parak. Vatetei Dina bat asher yalda le'yakov l'erot b'binot ha'aretz. And Dina, the daughter of Leah, who was born to Yaakov, went out to see the daughters of the land. Vayar ota Shechem ben chamor hachivi, nesi ha'aretz, vayikach ota, vayishkav ota vayaneha. And Shechem, the son of Hamor, the prince of the land, saw her. He took her and lay with her and violated her. Yaakov remained silent following his daughter's rape. And instead, her brothers, Shimon and Levi, go on a murderous rampage, wiping out not only Shechem and Hamor, but also all of the male inhabitants of the city. Suddenly, Dina, whose birth was barely even acknowledged in last week's Parsha, has become the focal point of the story and the first step in the unraveling of Yaakov's story. Dina herself remains a mystery. She never speaks in the Torah, and we never hear about her reactions to any of these events, or what she would have wanted. And in fact, she's only mentioned one more time in Parsha at Vayigash, in the entire Torah, where she is simply mentioned as one of Leah's children. To fill the void of the mystery of Leah, Chazal stepped in with a number of Midrashim to explain who Dina was, why she was raped, and what happened to her afterwards. First, Dina's origin. After Dina is born, the Torah tells us, Ve'achar yalda bat, v'tikrat shema Dina. And afterwards, Leah gave birth to a girl, and she called her Dina. Ve'izkor Elohim et Rachel, ve'yishma eleha Elohim, ve'yitach et Rachma. And God remembered Rachel, and God heard her, and opened her womb. The Yerushalmi and the Babli in Brachot both have different versions of this narrative, but both of them agree that Dina, in fact, was supposed to be a boy, but that her gender changed in the womb in response to Leah's prayer in the Yerushalmi and to Rachel's prayer in the Bavli, in order that Rachel herself could also merit to have two sons. So here, while Dina is not necessarily having a role as one of the mothers of one of the Shvatim, it is her birth as a girl that in fact allows Yosef to be born. It is through this Gemara that Dina gains a place among her brothers beyond simply the story of her violation. However, if Dina is more than, than just a plot tool used to create the first cracks between Yaakov and his sons, then how could it be that the Torah treats her so callously? What, would, what could it be that she would deserve to have such terrible violence done to her? According to the Midrash and Vayikra Rabbah, Dina's rape is actually intended to be a punishment for Yaakov. Yaakov had promised God in the beginning of Parshat Vayitze that if he returned to Canaan safely, he would give one-tenth of his possessions to God. But at this point in the narrative, he has returned Shalem, and yet he is upheld, he is delayed upholding his end of the bargain. Therefore, Yaakov falls victim to three of the biggest sins in Judaism, to idolatry through the sin of Rachel, to bloodshed through his son Shimon and Levi, and to sexual impropriety through Dina. This model, however, is tremendously theologically problematic. Why would Dina be punished for Yaakov's sins? The Midrash never answers this question, instead seeming to assume that punishing a daughter for the sins of her father is a real, reasonable theological construct. Obviously, this is very difficult for us as modern readers, especially because the Torah never tells us what happens to Dina following her rape. But here again, the Midrash steps in to tell us the rest of Dina's story. According to Pirkei de Rebeliezer, Dina conserves a, conceives a daughter via this rape and names her Osnat. In order to protect this daughter, the angel Michael takes the baby down to Mitzrayim where she is adopted and raised in the house of Potiphera. When Osnat grows up, she marries Yosef, thus attracting Dina and Yosef at the end of their lives, just as they were joined together in the beginning. So through this rabbinic lens, Dina becomes a much fuller character, allowing her to transcend the rape and allowing her to become more than simply the terrible thing that happened to her. While she might be a one-dimensional character in the Torah, she becomes a fully developed person with intimate connections to her family especially to Yaakov and to Yosef. These Midrashim are a great example of the success of the rabbinic project. The point is not to remove or smooth over difficulties in the text, but instead to explain where there are gaps, 
creating a fuller picture of why it is that Dina is so important. And while the rabbi's answers might not always be satisfying, it is encouraging that they try to offer answers at all, rather than relegating Dina to simply a symbol of sexual violence because of her gender. And perhaps then, our job as readers and learners is to continue this project with our own questions and creativity in mind. Shabbat shalom.